July 20th saw the release of the Star Trek Picard trailer at Comic-Con. After the issues it encountered during its development stage, such as licensees reportedly bailing out on it, Netflix outright passing on it, and a change of showrunner in the early stages of production, many were excited about what the trailer would deliver. As it turned out, the reception was an overall positive one. Even the editorial team at Midnight's Edge were pleasantly surprised about the tone, what can be surmised of the story, and the direction they appear to be taking. However, someone with deep connections to the Star Trek world was quick to point out that despite all the writers and producers involved in the making of this series, it would appear that without the appropriate credits being given, the core concept has been swiped from a previously involved creator who never worked on this iteration of the Picard series. What I found most interesting about that is I'd heard all of this before, this concept for a Picard series. It, it was something that I already knew about and I'd already heard heard about it. And I'd heard about it from Brian Fuller. Brian Fuller pitched, I don't know exactly how he pitched it, but he came up with this idea or a version of this idea that was actually registered with the WGA. And he spoke to both Jerry Ryan and Brent Spiner about this very topic, this very series, this very premise a number of years ago when he was working on Star Trek Discovery. Naturally, we reached out to both Robert Meyer Burnett himself as well as our sources for more on the story. And what we found is about to be relayed to you. In this video, we will begin recapping Brian Fuller's past involvement with Star Trek and how his involvement came to an end, before going through what Robert Meyer Burnett had to say on the matter, including how Brian Fuller reacted to seeing his work come to life in the Picard trailer without any credit being given to him. Then, we'll reveal what our inside sources have to say before providing an update on the impending CBS Viacom remerger and what it could mean for all things Star Trek. Brian Fuller started out writing for Star Trek Deep Space Nine before moving on to writing, story editing, and co-producing Star Trek Voyager. During his tenure on Voyager, he contributed to both the character of Seven of Nine and the further evolution of the Borg. Keep that in mind because we'll get back to that later. Following Star Trek, he went on to write and produce, among other things, series like Dead Like Me, Pushing Daisies, Hannibal, and American Gods. Fuller was always an avid fan of Star Trek and lobbied for years for the opportunity to serve as showrunner on a new Star Trek series. Rights holder CBS had no interest in pursuing any more Star Trek beyond passively collecting merchandise revenue. That is until former CEO Les Moonves decided the brand would serve as a good means to an end of promoting their streaming service All Access. This is where Fuller's previous lobbying paid off, and he was given the opportunity to pitch a number of ideas to CBS. Of these pitches, Star Trek Discovery was the one they went with. In its original iteration, Brian Fuller's Star Trek Discovery was intended to be part of the original Star Trek canon and sync up with the original series. However, as we mentioned, up until that point, CBS had no desire to actually make any new Star Trek. Paramount and their production wing, Bad Robot, however, did. Years earlier, CBS had issued them a license to both produce and monetize their own brand of Star Trek, an alternate Star Trek, if you will, details of which can be found in this video. As part of the deal, CBS agreed not to make any Star Trek of their own for a period of 10 years, while Paramount built their alternate Star Trek brand on film. CBS had no intention of making any more Star Trek when this deal was signed, but Star Trek Discovery came into play before the decade was up. Arbitration ensued and reportedly ended with Secret Hideout, the alleged Section 31 wing of Bad Robot, Paramount's appointed Star Trek production company taking over Star Trek Discovery and making it under their alternate license. This is where Alex Kurtzman, writer and producer of Bad Robot's Star Trek 09 and Star Trek Into Darkness, came aboard Star Trek Discovery and started reworking it to fit his vision and the requirement of the alternate license. Soon after Alex Kurtzman arrived, Brian Fuller departed. Although Brian Fuller's initial vision and plan for Discovery was heavily rewritten, it would appear that his earlier pitches for a Star Trek series were kept on hand. When I saw the trailer for Picard, it, it seemed strangely familiar to me. Now, Brian Fuller developed five different pieces for uh, Star Trek when he was involved in the creation of Discovery. And one of those things was something he called Data and Picard. And I will read it to you. I will read to you what it says. This story begins after Ambassador Spock has disappeared into a rupture in the space-time continuum, creating the alternate timeline that contains the J.J. Abrams film universe. 
This tale takes place in the Prime universe, picking up with the Next Generation crew's adventures. The planet Romulus is experiencing a worldwide evacuation as its star is about to go supernova. Leading that evacuation is Captain Data, coordinating a massive effort with a fleet of starships. The Romulan star goes boom, its shockwave racing toward the planet and certain destruction. Captain Data thinks quickly, employing seven of nine and a fleet of Borg expats from the long defeated Borg to save as many as possible with mass assimilation technology. It's a brilliant and terrifying move and a questionable one. I would assume Brian was using that because uh, how quickly people can be beamed away as we saw in First Contact. He actually thought ahead of time on that, yeah. Yeah, the mission is only a partial success and those rescued were traumatized by Borg ships appearing in their atmosphere and scooping up Romulans as if they were being assimilated. This raises question in Data's leadership style and his insensitivity to organics. Meanwhile, Ambassador Picard is having a difficult time finding home for Romulan refugees. Their sister planet Vulcan wants nothing to do with them. And Starfleet has new concerns with Data's support of Seven of Nine and the Borg expats. Starfleet draws Picard into direct conflict with Data. Picard's concerns with the Borg are based on his abduction and imprisonment and brainwashing by the Borg, and his trust for Data, now a captain of considerable accomplishment, is being challenged. To make matters worse, Picard fears his Eremotic Syndrome. The genetic disease sleeping in his cells is waking up and loosening his own grip on reality. His only saving grace could come with the help of the Borg and returning to his time as Locutus of Borg to save the past and present and himself. So that was something that initially came from Brian Fuller. Uh, he uh, apparently it was related to me that he, he told me that it was registered with the WGA, the Writers Guild of America. And he also said he contacted both Brent Spiner and Jerry Ryan and spoke to them about this idea. Brian said he pitched five series mm -hmm. and they have two of them in development and another based on an original character he created for Discovery. And um, so that's that's uh, and, and Brian Fuller, I can't I, I, I spoke with him today and he said that I can say that he spoke with both Jerry Ryan and Brent Spiner about reprising their roles while he was still working on Star Trek. And uh, just before we went live, you also said uh, the new trailer made him cry. That's what he said. Yeah. <sighs> wow. And not in a good way, you said. No. No. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Here it should be noted that Brian Fuller made the Picard and Data pitch, as well as all others, as work for hire. So CBS can conceivably make the claim that they don't have to give him credit, which they would legally be in the right to do. Morally, however, refraining from giving a creator credit where credit is due is a terrible thing to do. Case in point, even Marvel will give the comic book creators of their various characters in their stable on-screen creator credit. On occasion, even a cameo, like how Jim Starlin, creator of Thanos, appeared on-screen in Avengers Endgame as a member of Captain America's support group. Based on this trailer, it looks as though Brian Fuller's foundation has been important for the final Picard series as his work on Discovery was for that series. So withholding credit in this instance comes across as particularly petty. In addition to hearing what Robert Meyer Burnett had to say on the matter, we also reached out to our sources close to the production for any inside word on what might have transpired here and how it ties in with the previous rumors emanating from the production. Since this cannot be independently verified, the information to follow should be treated as rumor, pending independent confirmation. Apparently, the powers that be at CBS and Secret Hideout liked Fuller's initially discarded idea for Picard and Data so much that the entire Picard series evolved around it. Under Kurtzman, however, it got the same dark and flashy New Trek makeover as Discovery did, inspired by the J.J. Abrams-directed movies. 
This new track decal on top, in addition to the preliminary story alterations, is what caused the licensees to riot and walk out, as we've covered before. It is also what caused Netflix to pass on the series, leaving the path free for Amazon to pick up international distribution rights at a lower price point than CBS originally wanted. Production didn't begin in earnest until Amazon entered the fray and infused the necessary cash weeks after filming was supposed to have begun. Furthermore, the first production block was filmed in accordance with Kurtzman's original vision, which did not go down well when the footage was screened. This in turn contributed to CBS effectively removing Kurtzman from day-to-day -day operations. As director of production company Bad Robot, which CBS are, for the time being, still legally locked in with, Kurtzman still has a figurehead presence, but showrunning duties were given to Michael Chabon. The de facto change of showrunners, production delays, and the overruns have caused them to be months behind schedule. Star Trek Picard, which was promised before the end of 2019, has now been pushed back to an early 2020 release. The Picard series is too big to fail, so it is our understanding that Shaban was given the mandate to scale back the new Trek decal, reel it back to the appearance more associated with canon, and license whatever was needed from the next generation era for screen use in the Picard series. Behind this mandate were Amazon, CBS, and according to some rumors, an individual of note who may yet be very important to the future of Star Trek. As we previously reported, all the problems the Star Trek brand has endured over the past decade can be traced back to the 2005 corporate split of the old Viacom, a split which led to the previously unified Star Trek rights being fractured and broken up, and with CBS, a company that never had anything to do with Star Trek before, receiving the ultimate ownership of the franchise. The split was originally mandated by Sumner Redstone, the majority shareholder of both companies by way of national amusements. For the past few years, his daughter, Sherry Redstone, has pushed hard toward the remerging of CBS and Viacom, with significant strides having been made towards that end. At the time of making this video, the biggest obstacles are sorting out post-merger executive positions and paying off opportunist minority shareholders. Both of these can be overcome, so a merger could be announced in the not-too-distant future. For Star Trek, this wouldn't mean too much in the short term, due to binding deals still in play with, among others, Alex Kurtzman, Secret Hideout, Bad Robot, as well as between CBS and Paramount. In the longer term, however, Star Trek would be back under one roof. As of all of these individual deals would either expire or if need be bought out, Star Trek would in time experience a reunification of its own. A unified Star Trek has been stated as one of the main reasons for the drive to remerge CBS and Viacom in the first place. The Star Trek brand went under one roof has a built-in transmedia potential most other studios of franchises can only dream of. That kind of potential can keep a company afloat in an increasingly more competitive media and entertainment industry, one where franchises with as much potential as Star Trek are a rare commodity, and one worth going through demanding corporate actions and legal wrangling to obtain. Be sure to check out Robert Meyer Burnett's original Brian Fuller revelation, plus our full uncut subsequent discussion with him by clicking the links. Also, leave a comment and share your opinion on all of this. Finally, please share the video itself, click subscribe, and smash that bell for more updates as they become available. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a comment, like it, and help share it. Or if you didn't, tell us why in the comments. If you did enjoy it, then feel free to subscribe, but remember to hit the bell icon to select that you want notifications all the time, otherwise YouTube might randomly unsubscribe you. Midnight's Edge is completely independent and devoted to bringing you the intelligent analysis of the inner workings of the film industry and genre media. If you like what we do, then we would be very grateful if you could help us keep the lights on by supporting us on Patreon or on Subscribestar. Our backers receive exclusive rewards and bonuses. Before you go, check out these other videos that may interest you, and our sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark for more live shows and more laid-back content.